Hello everyone. Uh, this is my Booker Prize long list review of Fiona Mosley's M uh, Elmet. Let me say that right. Elmet, um, which was one of the surprise wildcard uh, debuts on the list this year, along with Emily Friedman's History of Wolves. Um, it's also uh, one of the books I knew almost nothing about before I before I read it, uh, which is always an exciting to be, place to be, a new, a new author and a book about which I have no prior knowledge. So, Elmet, it is about a boy called Daniel who is in his teens at the time of the novel, uh, who lives in a forest in Yorkshire with his older sister, Cathy, um, and with their daddy. Um, and their daddy is a huge man, um, an ex-fighter, uh, uh, bare, bare knuckle fighter, um, and the three of them live there in almost complete seclusion from the west, rest of the world. And the novel has two narrative strands. One is in the present, where Daniel is desperately, desperately looking for his sister and crossing the country looking for his sister. Um, and the second is a little bit in time previously, it's not clear for a while how much earlier it is, um, in the events leading up to what turned out to be his sister's disappearance. So it has quite a, quite a neat um, narrative tension built into it. Um, and this is a novel, it's, it's told entirely from Daniel's point of view, and that gives it quite a restricted point of view. So he is a relatively young child um, when a lot of the narrative is being told, or as he looks back to a lot of the narrative. Um, so you get the slightly dislocating sense of um, the, a view of the world from someone who doesn't really understand what's going on, uh, which is rather, rather cleverly managed. So the first half of the novel, um, apart from these sort of brief sections in the present tense where he's looking for Cathy, most of the first half of the novel is, is about them living in this forest, how they come to live in this forest, what it is to build yourself a home to fashion items out of the wood in the forest around you. Um, so it's a very, it's a very rural novel uh, in, for the first half. It's very, very deeply physical. It reminded me of a lot of uh, novels by a writer called Conan Jones, who is a Welsh writer um, and writes, uh, he, he is known for nature writing, which is a phrase that he hates, but, but it's writing about what it is like to be not necessarily intellectually engaged in the world, but utterly physically engaged in, uh, in activities of living a rural life. So for Jones, a lot of it is about things like um, uh, looking after sheep through the lambing season, or um, uh, badger badger baiting, badger fights. Um, in the case of Elmet, the novel is very much about the the living in the middle of the wood and the the, the touch of the wood and what what the wood is used for and how you go about looking after a copse. And it's it's a very um, very rurally focused. Uh, novel uh, and that fits as well with the title Elmet is a, an old word for West Yorkshire which I didn't know despite having grown up in West Yorkshire. So the first half is this very rural um, side I suspect there are probably uh, echoes of, of Ted Hughes in there as well. The second half then becomes much more uh, plot driven um, without giving much away it becomes extremely extremely violent um, I've seen a couple of uh, bits of reviews elsewhere as I've flicked around the internet um, which have described this as rural noir. Well, the first half is the rural and the second half is the, is the noir. Um, and so it becomes a very, a very plot-focused, uh, violent novel in the second half in a whole range of different ways. And it's about uh, an interesting range of topics. So um, Daniel and Cathy and their, and their huge taciturn uh, daddy um, are in a sense outlaws from society. There's an earlier stage in the novel where Daniel and Cathy are at a normal school uh, and various things go wrong um, and daddy then, daddy who is a man who doesn't understand the world then takes them away and they effectively squat on land and build a house on land which which isn't theirs um, and it, there, there's then a phase later on where, where daddy is going and um, almost agitating among the local population for strikes against the farmers, he uses his fighting skills to 
um, to help some of the local poor rural labourers get their own back on the landowners. Uh, landowners. So there's a sense of, of outlaw life. Um, I, the Robin Hood kept coming to my mind as I thought about it. The man, the man in the forest who is fighting altruistically for the sake of the rural poor around him. And that's really played up. There's quite a lot about uh, the politics of rural West Yorkshire where there are no jobs left, where the mines have closed, uh, where where landlords own vast swathes of land, where the right to buy um, policy for council housing in the 1980s has resulted in there being no social housing either. So it's no longer a council looking after people, it's landlords who are determined to uh, to uh, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for uh, to get to get as much as they can out of these people to exploit these people. So there's a big sense of that, and the politics occasionally within the novel becomes a little bit hectoring. There are parts where I felt that this was the author speaking and not the character speaking, even though theoretically it was through their voices, which jumped out a bit at me. But it doesn't. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen a huge amount. And this sense of the what what is the modern outlaw? How how would that work if, if there was a modern Robin Hood? How would that work? I found um, I found quite interesting. Um. What I found almost most interesting, though, was the the atmosphere of the novel. So there's a huge sense of, I mean, it is it, the novel is actually happening on these two narrative strands, as I said, but there is a, a much deeper sense that the novel is happening almost in two time periods simultaneously. So in a, it is clearly happening in modern Yorkshire. So the mines are closed. Uh, right to buy is is mentioned quite a lot. Um, there's, there's a little bit, I think, about immigrants coming in to do rural work for lower wages than locals will take. Uh, there's the um, East Coast Main Line, which is the main railway line up the east coast of the UK, and the Pendolino trains that go up and down it. So there's, there's quite a strong sense of the physical and political reality of modern Yorkshire. But at the same time, the novel is written as though it is happening in a deep and distant rather mythical past. It has a very, very strange atmosphere um, to the extent that I assumed for the first few pages actually that it was happening in some in some distant uh, prehistoric path and past. And I think that's partly the restricted viewpoint um, and the slightly childish viewpoint that gave me a sense that this was slightly earlier in human evolution. It's partly that it is so rurally focused and so focused on things which have remained consistent in the physical world since um, prehistoric times. So this physicality, particularly of of wood. Um, and so, well, I was actually I was quite shocked when the when the references to the iron of the railway lines and things came in. So it does have this fascinating sense of being uh, happening simultaneously in an ancient and in a relatively modern world, which is something that I haven't haven't seen elsewhere. Um, and there are some wonderful there are some wonderful scenes. Uh, so there's a fantastic scene where Daniel in the um, in the present tense uh, parts of the narrative is looking for his sister, starving 15 year old boy who hasn't eaten properly for days and walks into a sort of um, uh, roadside uh, cafe um and effectively begs for food begs for hot food and it's incredibly tenderly told this this skinny boy with matted hair and dirty clothes screwing up his courage to go into the cafe and ask and then the kind lady behind the counter um giving him as much whatever pie it is i can't remember and then um ap hot apple crumble or something for pudding um and that's that's beautifully told there are some very tender moments there's also a wonderful moment where daniel and kathy together are washing their father's beard and trimming it and trimming his hair and, and again it's a strong sense of of physicality and that aspect of their life together but also a deeply tender uh, depiction of this relationship with their daddy which looking from the outside is really quite quite strange i mean their daddy is a is a deeply violent man um and yet there's this huge tenderness between the father and the and the two children 
and a lot of the writing is is absolutely lovely actually particularly in the first part i mean the 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 opening chapters um not so much in the part of the narrative which is in the present tense but in the bits that's looking back are very very beautifully written i just wanted to read you a section of that um just as a as an example of what i mean this is actually from slightly later in the book but still very much on the the rural side of things so spring came in earnest this is when they're living in the living in the wood having built their house on the land that they're squatting on spring came in earnest with clouds of pollen and dancing swifts the little birds, back here to nest after a flight of a million miles, were buffeted by the wind, which blew hot, then cold, and clipped unripened catkins off the ash. The swifts were too light to charge at the gulls, like gulls. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the swifts were too light to charge at the gusts, like gulls or crows, and through them I saw wind as sea, thick pillowy waves that rolled at earthen wooded shores and through tiny creatures at juttering rocks. The swifts surfed and dived and cut through the invisible mass, which to them must have roared and wailed as loudly as any ocean on earth, only to catch the air up again on the up updraft and rise to the crest. They were experts, they knew how it was done, and they brought the true spring. Not the spring that sent timid green shoots through compacted, frost-bitten soil, but the spring that came with a rush of colour, a blanket of light, unfurling insects and absent, missed prodigal birds on this prevailing southwesterly. Apologies for my reading, uh, but the writing the writing is very lovely, um, and and as I say, it's it, all of those things are are both interesting and and worth reading this book for. Overall, I found the book slightly unbalanced. So the the sense of this is about the the a profound relationship with nature through the first half was one type of book. The the rural noir as a, as a as it is, has been described elsewhere, the the deep violence of the second half of the book, I found didn't really quite work as a contrast. I can I can see perhaps what it's meant to do in the sense of you you set up one um, situation and then it is so thoroughly destroyed that the act of destruction almost feels more effective because you have set up something else so clearly beforehand. Um, but to me, it, it it seemed to turn from one sort of book into another in a way that uh, I didn't I didn't feel quite worked, and in a way that wasn't really anticipated at the end. I think if you're going to do that, you then have to bring back at the end something of the the deep rural physicality in order to reground the end of the novel in what in, in where it started. And this book book doesn't do that, so I found it structurally. Uh, rather unbalanced. I also found some aspects of the characters not particularly credible. So you have these two children growing up with their father who seem never to uh, really rebel against him or rebel against the strange life that they're leading. There's a tiny little bit of that from Daniel late on, but really very, very little. Um, and so that, that was a rather um, unexplained dynamic to me, which didn't really quite seem to work. I also felt that the quality of the writing dropped somewhat in the second half, and that partly went with the change in what the book was about. Um, but if you have watched this channel much at all, you will know that quality of writing matters a lot to me. It's one of the things that I talk about the most. I should probably do a video sometime on what I actually mean by that phrase. Um, but it, the quality of the writing was much lower in the second half as it moved into this um, plot-driven um, uh, violent story that contrasted so much with the first half. So that didn't really uh, keep me excited about reading to the end of this book. And so as I think about this in the context of the long list as a whole, it is an interesting book. If I was, if I was being blunt, I would say it's, it's possibly a little bit misshapen. Um, I think it, and I'm, I'm partly allowed to say that because my own first novel was was a bit misshapen, um, and and so I think it is a thing with debut novels that you sometimes don't get the the structure right, and it's a, it's a, a fascinating debut novel. Um, I would be surprised if this makes the shortlist. Uh, I don't think it will make my shortlist, but it was an, it was an interesting read. It's something I I'm very happy to have read. Um, uh, yes, so I'd be very very interested to to know what 
any of you thought of Elmet as you as you read it or any thoughts that you have about it more generally as you go as you go through. Uh, next on my list is Zadie Smith's Swing Time, which would be an utterly different sort of book. Um, I've, I've heard good things about it, I've heard bad things about it, so I'm very much looking forward to starting to read that uh, probably later this evening. Uh, so until the, until the Zadie Smith Swing Time video, look after yourselves and I'll be back soon. <laughs>